Ephesians This epistle was written when St. Paul was a prisoner at Rome. The design appears to be to strengthen the Ephesians in the faith of Christ, and to give exalted views of the love of God, and of the dignity and excellence of Christ, fortifying their minds against the scandal of the cross. He shows that they were saved by grace, and that however wretched they once were, they now have equal privileges with the Jews. He encourages them to persevere in their Christian calling, and urges them to walk in a manner becoming their profession, faithfully discharging the general and common duties of religion, and the special duties of particular relations. 1904 Ephesians chapter 1 chapter outline a salutation, and an account of saving, 1-8 blessings, as prepared in God's eternal election, as purchased by Christ's blood, and as conveyed in effectual calling, 9-14 This is applied to the believing Jews, and to the believing Gentiles. The Apostle thanks God for their faith, 15-23 and love, and prays for the continuance of their knowledge and hope, with respect to the heavenly inheritance, and to God's powerful working in them. Verses 1, 2 All Christians must be saints. If they come not under that character on earth, they will never be saints in glory. Those are not saints, who are not faithful, believing in Christ, and true to the profession they make a relation to their Lord. By grace, understand the free and undeserved love and favor of God, and those graces of the Spirit which come from it. By peace, all other blessings, spiritual and temporal, the fruits of the former. No peace without grace. No peace, nor grace, but from God the Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, and the best saints need fresh supplies of the graces of the Spirit, and desire to grow. Verses 3 8 Spiritual and heavenly blessings are the best blessings, with which we cannot be miserable, and without which we cannot but be so. This was from the choice of them in Christ, before the foundation of the world, that they should be made holy by separation from sin, being set apart to God, and sanctified by the Holy Spirit, in consequence of their election in Christ. All who are chosen to happiness as the end, are chosen to holiness as the means. In love they were predestinated, or foreordained, to be adopted as children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, and to be openly admitted to the privileges of that high relation to himself. The reconciled and adopted believer, the pardoned sinner, gives all the praise of his salvation to his gracious Father. His love appointed this method of redemption, spared not his own Son, and brought believers to hear and embrace this salvation. It was rich grace to provide such a surety as his own Son, and freely to deliver him up. This method of grace gives no encouragement to evil, but shows sin in all its hatefulness, and how it deserves vengeance. The believer's actions, as well as his words, declare the praises of divine mercy. 1905 Chapter 1 Verses 914 Blessings were made known to believers, by the Lord's showing to them the mystery of his sovereign will, and the method of redemption and salvation. But these must have been forever hidden from us, if God had not made them known by his written word, preached gospel, and spirit of truth. Christ united the two differing parties, God and man, in his own person, and satisfied for that wrong which caused the separation. He wrought, by his Spirit, those graces of faith and love, whereby we are made one with God, and among ourselves. He dispenses all his blessings, according to his good pleasure. His divine teaching led whom he pleased to see the glory of those truths, which others were left to blaspheme. What a gracious promise that is, which secures the gift of the Holy Ghost to those who ask him. The sanctifying and comforting influences of the Holy Spirit seal believers as the children of God, and heirs of heaven. These are the first fruits of holy happiness. For this we were made, and for this we were redeemed. This is the great design of God in all that he has done for us. Let all be ascribed unto the praise of his glory. Verses 15-23 God has laid up spiritual blessings for us in his Son, the Lord Jesus, but requires us to draw them out and fetch them in by prayer. Even the best Christians need to be prayed for, and while we hear of the welfare of Christian friends, we should pray for them. Even true believers greatly want heavenly wisdom. Are not the best of us unwilling to come under God's yoke, 
though there is no other way to find rest for the soul, do we not for a little pleasure often part with our peace? And if we dispute less, and prayed more with and for each other, we should daily see more and more what is the hope of our calling, and the riches of the divine glory in this inheritance. It is desirable to feel the mighty power of divine grace, beginning in carrying on the work of faith in our souls. But it is difficult to bring a soul to believe fully in Christ, and to venture its all, and the hope of eternal life, upon his righteousness. Nothing less than almighty power will work this in us. Here is signified that it is Christ the Savior, who supplies all the necessities of those who trust in him, and gives them all blessings in the richest abundance. And by being partakers of Christ himself, we come to be filled with the fullness of grace and glory in him. How then do those forget themselves who seek for righteousness out of him? This teaches us to come to Christ. And did we know what we are called to, and what we might find in him, surely we should come and be suitors to him. When feeling our weakness and the power of our enemies, we most perceive the greatness of that mighty power which affects the conversion of the believer, and is engaged to perfect his salvation. Surely this will constrain us by love to live to our Redeemer's glory. 1906 Chapter 1 Chapter 2 Chapter Outline The riches of God's grace towards men, 110 Shown from their deplorable state by nature, and the happy change divine grace makes in them. The Ephesians called to reflect on their 1113 state of heathenism, and the privileges and blessings of the 1422 gospel. Verses 110 Sin is the death of the soul. A man dead in trespasses and sins has no desire for spiritual pleasures. When we look upon a corpse, it gives an awful feeling. A never-dying spirit is now fled, and has left nothing but the ruins of a man. But if we view things aright, we should be far more affected by the thought of a dead soul, a lost, fallen spirit. A state of sin is a state of conformity to this world. Wicked men are slaves to Satan. Satan is the author of that proud, carnal disposition which there is in ungodly men. He rules in the hearts of men. From scripture, it is clear, that whether men have been most prone to sensual or to spiritual wickedness, all men, being naturally children of disobedience, are also by nature children of wrath. What reason have sinners, then, to seek earnestly for that grace which will make them, of children of wrath, children of God and heirs of glory? God's eternal love or good will toward his creatures is the fountain whence all his mercies flow to us, and that love of God is great love, and that mercy is rich mercy. And every converted sinner is a saved sinner, delivered from sin and wrath. The grace that saves is the free, undeserved goodness and favor of God, and he saves, not by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus. Grace in the soul is a new life in the soul. A regenerated sinner becomes a living soul. He lives a life of holiness, being born of God. He lives, being delivered from the guilt of sin, by pardoning and justifying grace. Sinners roll themselves in the dust. Sanctified souls sit in heavenly places, are raised above this world, by Christ's grace. The goodness of God in converting and saving sinners heretofore, encourages others in after time, to hope in his grace and mercy. Our faith, our conversion, and our eternal salvation, are not of works, lest any man should boast. These things are not brought to pass by anything done by us, therefore all boasting is shut out. All is the free gift of God, and the effect of being quickened by his power. It was his purpose, to which he prepared us, by blessing us with the knowledge of his will, and his Holy Spirit producing such a change in us that we should glorify God 1907 chapter 2 by our good conversation and perseverance in holiness. None can from scripture abuse this doctrine or accuse it of any tendency to evil. All who do so are without excuse. Verses 11 13 Christ and his covenant are the foundation of all the Christian's hopes. A sad and terrible description is here, but who is able to remove himself out of it? Would that this were not a true description of many baptized in the name of Christ. Who can, without trembling, reflect upon the misery of a person, separated forever from the people of God, cut off from the body of Christ, fallen from the covenant of promise, having no hope, no Savior, 
and without any God but a God of vengeance, to all eternity. To have no part in Christ. What true Christian can hear this without horror? Salvation is far from the wicked, but God is a help at hand to his people, and this is by the sufferings and death of Christ. Verses 14-18 Jesus Christ made peace by the sacrifice of himself. In every sense Christ was their peace, the author, center, and substance of their being at peace with God, and of their union with the Jewish believers in one church. Through the person, sacrifice, and mediation of Christ, sinners are allowed to draw near to God as a father, and are brought with acceptance into his presence, with their worship and services, under the teaching of the Holy Spirit, as one with the Father and the Son. Christ purchased leave for us to come to God, and the Spirit gives a heart to come, and strength to come, and then grace to serve God acceptably. Verses 19-22 The church is compared to a city, and every converted sinner is free of it. It is also compared to a house, and every converted sinner is one of the family, a servant, and a child in God's house. The church is also compared to a building, founded on the doctrine of Christ, delivered by the prophets of the Old Testament, and the apostles of the New. God dwells in all believers now, they become the temple of God through the working of the blessed spirit. Let us then ask if our hopes are fixed on Christ, according to the doctrine of his word? Have we devoted ourselves as holy temples to God through him? Are we habitations of God by the Spirit? Are we spiritually minded? And do we bring forth the fruits of the Spirit? Let us take heed not to grieve the Holy Comforter. Let us desire his gracious presence and his influences upon our hearts. Let us seek to discharge the duties allotted to us to the glory of God. 1908 Chapter 2 Chapter 3 Chapter Outline The Apostle sets forth his office and his 1-7 qualifications for it and his call to it. Also the noble purposes answered by 812 it. He prays for the Ephesians 1319 and adds a thanksgiving 20, 21 verses 17 for having preached the doctrine of truth, the apostle was a prisoner, but a prisoner of Jesus Christ, the object of special protection and care, while thus suffering for him. All the gracious offers of the gospel, and the joyful tidings it contains, come from the rich grace of God. It is the great means by which the Spirit works grace in the souls of men. The mystery is that secret, hidden purpose of salvation through Christ. This was not so fully and clearly shown in the ages before Christ, as unto the prophets of the New Testament. This was the great truth made known to the Apostle, that God would call the Gentiles to salvation by faith in Christ. An effectual working of divine power attends the gifts of divine grace. As God appointed Paul to the office, so he qualified him for it. Verses 812 Those whom God advances to honorable employments, he makes low in their own eyes. And where God gives grace to be humble, there he gives all other needful grace. How highly he speaks of Jesus Christ, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Though many are not enriched with these riches, yet how great a favor to have them preached among us, and to have an offer of them. And if we are not enriched with them it is our own fault. The first creation, when God made all things out of nothing, and the new creation, whereby sinners are made new creatures by converting grace, are of God by Jesus Christ. His riches are as unsearchable and as sure as ever, yet while angels adore the wisdom of God in the redemption of his church, the ignorance of self-wise and carnal men deems the whole to be foolishness. Verses 13-19 The Apostle seems to be more anxious lest the believers should be discouraged and faint upon his tribulations than for what he himself had to bear. He asks for spiritual blessings, which are the best blessings. Strength from the Spirit of God in the inner man, strength in the soul, the strength of faith, to serve God, and to do our duty. If the law of Christ is written in our hearts, and the love of Christ is shed abroad there, then Christ dwells there. Where 1909 chapter 3 his spirit dwells, there he dwells. We should desire that good affections may be fixed in us. And how desirable to have a fixed sense of the love of God in Christ to our souls. How powerfully the apostle speaks of the love of Christ. The breath shows its extent to all nations and ranks. The length, 
that it continues from everlasting to everlasting. The depth, it's saving those who are sunk into the depths of sin and misery. The height, it's raising them up to heavenly happiness and glory. Those who receive grace for grace from Christ fullness, may be said to be filled with the fullness of God. Should not this satisfy man? Must he needs fill himself with a thousand trifles, fancying thereby to complete his happiness? Verses 20, 21 It is proper always to end prayers with praises. Let us expect more, and ask for more, encouraged by what Christ has already done for our souls, being assured that the conversion of sinners, and the comfort of believers, will be to his glory, forever and ever. 1910 Chapter 3 Chapter 4 Chapter Outline Exhortations to Mutual Forbearance and 1-6 Union To a due use of spiritual gifts and 7-16 Graces To purity and holiness 1724 and to take heed of the sins practiced 2532 among the heathen verses 1 6 nothing is pressed more earnestly in the scriptures than to walk as becomes those called to christ kingdom and glory by lowliness understand humility which is opposed to pride by meekness that excellent disposition of soul which makes men unwilling to provoke and not easily to be provoked or offended we find much in ourselves for which we can hardly forgive ourselves. Therefore we must not be surprised if we find in others that which we think it hard to forgive. There is one Christ in whom all believers hope, and one heaven they are all hoping for. Therefore they should be of one heart. They had all one faith, as to its object, author, nature, and power. They all believed the same as to the great truths of religion. They had all been admitted into the church by one baptism with water, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, as the sign of regeneration. In all believers God the Father dwells, as in His holy temple, by His Spirit and special grace. Verses 7-16 Unto every believer is given some gift of grace, for their mutual help. All is given as seems best to Christ to bestow upon every one. He receives for them, that he might give to them, a large measure of gifts and graces, particularly the gift of the Holy Ghost. Not a mere head knowledge, or bare knowledge in Christ to be the Son of God, but such as brings trust and obedience. There is a fullness in Christ, and a measure of that fullness given in the counsel of God to every believer. But we never come to the perfect measure till we come to heaven. God's children are growing, as long as they are in this world, and the Christian's growth tends to the glory of Christ. The more a man finds himself drawn out to improve in his station, and according to his measure, all that he has received, to the spiritual good of others, he may the more certainly believe that he has the grace of sincere love and charity rooted in his heart. F. 4. 17. Minus 24. 19. 11. Chapter 4. Verses 17. 24. The Apostles charged the Ephesians in the name and by the authority of the Lord Jesus, that having professed the gospel, they should not be as the unconverted Gentiles, who walked in vain fancies and carnal affections. Do not men, on every side, walk in the vanity of their minds? Must not we then urge the distinction between real and nominal Christians? They were void of all saving knowledge. They sat in darkness, and loved it rather than light. They had a dislike and hatred to a life of holiness, which is not only the way of life God requires and approves, and by which we live to Him, but which has some likeness to God Himself in His purity, righteousness, truth, and goodness. The truth of Christ appears in its beauty and power, when it appears as in Jesus. The corrupt nature is called a man. Like the human body, it is of diverse parts, supporting and strengthening one another. Sinful desires are deceitful lusts. They promise men happiness, but render them more miserable, and bring them to destruction, if not subdued and mortified. These therefore must be put off, as an old garment, a filthy garment, they must be subdued and mortified. But it is not enough to shake off corrupt principles, we must have gracious ones. By the new man, is meant the new nature, the new creature, directed by a new principle, even regenerating grace, enabling a man to lead a new life of righteousness and holiness. This is created, or brought forth by God's almighty power. 
verses 25-28 Notice the particulars wherewith we should adorn our Christian profession. Take heed of everything contrary to truth. No longer flatter or deceive others. God's people are children who will not lie, who dare not lie, who hate and abhor lying. Take heed of anger and ungoverned passions. If there is just occasion to express displeasure at what is wrong, and to reprove, see that it be without sin. We give place to the devil, when the first motions of sin are not grievous to our souls, when we consent to them, and when we repeat an evil deed. This teaches that as sin, if yielded unto, lets in the devil upon us, we are to resist it, keeping from all appearance of evil. Idleness makes thieves. Those who will not work, expose themselves to temptations to steal. Men ought to be industrious, that they may do some good, and that they may be kept from temptation. They must labor, not only that they may live honestly, but that they may have to give to the wants of others. What then must we think of those called Christians, who grow rich by fraud, oppression, and deceitful practices? Alms, to be accepted of God, must not be gained by unrighteousness and robbery, but by honesty and industry. God hates robbery for burnt offerings. Verses 29-32 Filthy words proceed from corruption in the speaker, and they corrupt the minds and manners of those who hear them. Christians should beware of all such discourse. It is the duty of Christians to seek, by the blessing of God, to bring persons to think seriously, and 1912 chapter 4 to encourage and warn believers by their conversation. Be kind one to another. This sets forth the principle of love in the heart, and the outward expression of it, in a humble, courteous behavior. Mark how God's forgiveness causes us to forgive. God forgives us, though we had no cause to sin against Him. We must forgive, as He has forgiven us. All lying, and corrupt communications, that stir up evil desires and lusts, grieve the Spirit of God. Corrupt passions of bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking, and malice, grieve the Holy Spirit. Provoke not the Holy, blessed Spirit of God to withdraw His presence and His gracious influences. The body will be redeemed from the power of the grave at the resurrection day. Wherever that blessed Spirit dwells as a sanctifier, He is the earnest of all the joys and glories of that redemption day, and we should be undone, should God take away His Holy Spirit from us. 1913 Chapter 4 Chapter 5 Chapter Outline Exhortation to Brotherly Love 1. 2. Cautions against several sins 3. 14. Directions to a contrary behavior and 1521 to relative duties the duties of wives and husbands are, 20 to 33, enforced by the spiritual relation between Christ and the Church. Verses 1, 2 Because God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you, therefore be followers of God, imitators of God. Resemble Him especially in His love and pardoning goodness, as becomes those beloved by their Heavenly Father. In Christ's sacrifice, His love triumphs, and we are to consider it fully. Verses 314 Filthy lusts must be rooted out. These sins must be dreaded and detested. Here are not only cautions against gross acts of sin, but against what some may make light of. But these things are so far from being profitable, that they pollute and poison the hearers. Our cheerfulness should show itself as becomes Christians, in what may tend to God's glory. A covetous man makes a god of his money, places that hope, confidence, and delight, in worldly good, which should be in God only. Those who allow themselves, either in the lusts of the flesh or the love of the world, belong not to the kingdom of grace, nor shall they come to the kingdom of glory. When the vilest transgressors repent and believe the gospel, they become children of obedience, from whom God's wrath is turned away. Dare we make light of that which brings down the wrath of God? Sinners, like men in the dark, are going they know not whither, and doing they know not what. But the grace of God wrought a mighty change in the souls of many. Walk as children of light, as having knowledge and holiness. These works of darkness are unfruitful, whatever profit they may boast. For they end in the destruction of the impenitent sinner. There are many ways of abetting, or taking part in the sins of others. By commendation, counsel, consent, or concealment.
and if we share with others in their sins, we must expect to share in their plagues. If we do not reprove the sins of others, we have fellowship with them. A good man will be ashamed to speak of what many wicked men are not ashamed to do. We must have not only a sight and a knowledge that sin is sin, and in some measure shameful, but see it as a breach of God's holy law. After 1914 chapter 5 the example of prophets and apostles, we should call on those asleep and dead in sin, to awake and arise, that Christ may give them light. Verses 1521 Another remedy against sin, is care, or caution, it being impossible else to maintain purity of heart and life. Time is a talent given us by God, and it is misspent and lost when not employed according to his design. If we have lost our time heretofore, we must double our diligence for the future. Of that time which thousands on a dying bed would gladly redeem at the price of the whole world, how little do men think, and to what trifles they daily sacrifice it. People are very apt to complain of bad times, it were well if that stirred them more to redeem time. Be not unwise. Ignorance of our duty, and neglect of our souls, show the greatest folly. Drunkenness is a sin that never goes alone, but carries men into other evils. It is a sin very provoking to God. The drunkard holds out to his family and to the world the sad spectacle of a sinner hardened beyond what is common, and hastening to perdition. When afflicted or weary, let us not seek to raise our spirits by strong drink, which is hateful and hurtful, and only ends in making sorrows more felt. But by fervent prayer let us seek to be filled with the Spirit, and to avoid whatever may grieve our gracious Comforter. All God's people have reason to sing for joy. Though we are not always singing, we should be always giving thanks. We should never want disposition for this duty, as we never want matter for it, through the whole course of our lives. Always, even in trials and afflictions, and for all things, being satisfied of their loving intent, and good tendency. God keeps believers from sinning against him, and engages them to submit one to another in all he has commanded, to promote his glory, and to fulfill their duties to each other. Verses 22-33 The duty of wives is, submission to their husbands in the Lord, which includes honoring and obeying them, from a principle of love to them. The duty of husbands is to love their wives. The love of Christ to the church is an example, which is sincere, pure, and constant, notwithstanding her failures. Christ gave himself for the church, that he might sanctify it in this world, and glorify it in the next, that he might bestow on all his members a principle of holiness, and deliver them from the guilt, the pollution, and the dominion of sin, by those influences of the Holy Spirit, of which baptismal water was the outward sign. The church and believers will not be without spot or wrinkle till they come to glory. But those only who are sanctified now, shall be glorified hereafter. The words of Adam, mentioned by the Apostle, are spoken literally of marriage, but they have also a hidden sense in them, relating to the union between Christ and his church. It was a kind of type, as having resemblance. There will be failures and defects on both sides, in the present state of human nature, yet this does not alter the relation. All the duties of marriage are included in unity and love. And while we adore and rejoice in the condescending love of Christ, let husbands and wives learn hence 1915 chapter 5 their duties to each other. Thus the worst evils would be prevented, and many painful effects would be avoided. 1916 Chapter 5 Chapter 6 Chapter Outline and Duties of Children and Parents 1-4 Of Servants and Masters 5-9 All Christians are to put on spiritual 10-18 Armor against the enemies of their souls The Apostle desires their prayers and 1924 Ends with his apostolic blessing Verses 1-4 The great duty of children is to obey their parents That obedience includes inward reverence as well as outward acts, and in every age prosperity has attended those distinguished for obedience to parents. The duty of parents. Be not impatient. Use no unreasonable severities. Deal prudently and wisely with children. Convince their judgments and work upon their reason. Bring them up well, under proper and compassionate correction, and in the knowledge of the duty God requires. Often is this duty neglected, 
even among professors of the gospel, many set their children against religion, but this does not excuse the children's disobedience, though it may be awfully occasionate. God alone can change the heart, yet he gives his blessing to the good lessons and examples of parents, and answers their prayers. But those, whose chief anxiety is that their children should be rich and accomplished, whatever becomes of their souls, must not look for the blessing of God. Verses 5-9 The duty of servants is summed up in one word, obedience. The servants of old were generally slaves. The apostles were to teach servants and masters their duties, in doing which evils would be lessened, till slavery should be rooted out by the influence of Christianity. Servants are to reverence those over them. They are to be sincere, not pretending obedience when they mean to disobey, but serving faithfully and they must serve their masters not only when their master's eye is upon them, but must be strict in the discharge of their duty, when he is absent and out of the way. Steady regard to the Lord Jesus Christ will make men faithful and sincere in every station, not grudgingly or by constraint, but from a principle of love to the masters and their concerns. This makes service easy to them, pleasing to their masters and acceptable to the Lord Christ. God will reward even the meanest drudgery done from a sense of duty, and with a view to glorify him. Here is the duty of masters. Act after the same manner. Be just to servants, as you expect they should be to you. Show them 1917 chapter 6 like goodwill and concern for them, and be careful herein to approve yourselves to God. Be not tyrannical and overbearing. You have a master to obey, and you and they are but fellow servants in respect to Christ Jesus. If masters and servants would consider their duties to God, and the account they must shortly give to Him, they would be more mindful of their duty to each other, and thus families would be more orderly and happy. Verses 10-18 Spiritual strength and courage are needed for our spiritual warfare and suffering. Those who would prove themselves to have true grace, must aim at all grace, and put on the whole armor of God, which he prepares and bestows. The Christian armor is made to be worn, and there is no putting off our armor till we have done our warfare, and finished our course. The combat is not against human enemies, nor against our own corrupt nature only. We have to do with an enemy who has a thousand ways of beguiling unstable souls. The devils assault us in the things that belong to our souls and labor to deface the heavenly image in our hearts. We must resolve by God's grace, not to yield to Satan. Resist him, and he will flee. If we give way, he will get ground. If we distrust either our cause, or our leader, or our armor, we give him advantage. The different parts of the armor of heavy-armed soldiers, who had to sustain the fiercest assaults of the enemy, are here described. There is none for the back, nothing to defend those who turn back in the Christian warfare. Truth, or sincerity, is the girdle. This girds on all the other pieces of our armor, and is first mentioned. There can be no religion without sincerity. The righteousness of Christ, imputed to us, is a breastplate against the arrows of divine wrath. The righteousness of Christ implanted in us, fortifies the heart against the attacks of Satan. Resolution must be as greaves, or armor to our legs, and to stand their ground or to march forward in rugged paths, the feet must be shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Motives to obedience, amidst trials, must be drawn from a clear knowledge of the gospel. Faith is all in all in an hour of temptation. Faith, as relying on unseen objects, receiving Christ and the benefits of redemption, and so deriving grace from him, is like a shield, a defense every way. The devil is the wicked one. Violent temptations, by which the soul is set on fire of hell, are dart Satan shoots at us. Also, hard thoughts of God, and as to ourselves. Faith applying the word of God and the grace of Christ, quenches the darts of temptation. Salvation must be our helmet. A good hope of salvation, a scriptural expectation of victory, will purify the soul, and keep it from being defiled by Satan. To the Christian armed for defense in battle, the apostle recommends only one weapon of attack. But it is enough, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. 
it subdues and mortifies evil desires and blasphemous thoughts as they rise within, and answers unbelief and error as they assault from without. A single text, well understood, and rightly applied, at once destroys a temptation or an objection, and subdues the most formidable adversary. Prayer must fasten all the other parts of our Christian armor. There are other duties of religion, and of our stations in the world, but we must keep up 1918 chapter 6 times of prayer. Though set in solemn prayer may not be seasonable when it other duties are to be done, yet short pious prayers darted out, always are so. We must use holy thoughts in our ordinary course. A vain heart will be vain in prayer. We must pray with all kinds of prayer, public, private, and secret, social and solitary, solemn and sudden, with all the parts of prayer, confession of sin, petition for mercy, and thanksgiving for favors received. And we must do it by the grace of God the Holy Spirit, in dependence on, and according to, His teaching. We must preserve in particular requests, notwithstanding discouragements. We must pray, not for ourselves only, but for all saints. Our enemies are mighty, and we are without strength, but our Redeemer is almighty, and in the power of his mighty we may overcome. Wherefore we must stir up ourselves. Have not we, when God has called, often neglected to answer? Let us think upon these things, and continue our prayers with patience. F 6 19 minus 24 verses 1924 The gospel was a mystery till made known by divine revelation, and it is the work of Christ's ministers to declare it. The best and most eminent ministers need the prayers of believers. Those particularly should be prayed for, who are exposed to great hardships and perils in their work. Peace be to the brethren, and love with faith. By peace, understand all manner of peace, peace with God, peace of conscience, peace among themselves, and the grace of the Spirit, producing faith and love, and every grace. These he desires for those in whom they were already begun. And all grace and blessings come to the saints from God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace, that is, the favor of God, and all good, spiritual and temporal, which is from it, is and shall be with all those who thus love our Lord Jesus Christ in sincerity, and with them only.